point, I uh, have been sitting and reflecting on the shooting in Buffalo last Saturday. Uh, this morning at the Gate of Sweet Nectar, we dedicated the merits of the service to the 10 folks who were murdered last Saturday. Um, and so I've been thinking about how to talk about it, what role our practice plays um, in living with such atrocities. And something kind of came up, which is a little odd, and I'll try to make it make sense, but for some reason I thought it kind of reminded me of the story of the Buddha. And uh, I'll explain what I mean. So most of us know the story of the Buddha, but just kind of a quick summary. He was a prince of sorts, the son of a chieftain, a lord, uh, however you, you want to see it. He was definitely uh, a boy and a man of privilege. And his father shielded him from any kind of suffering, right? He was given a life of pure pleasure, joy, youth, beauty. They shielded him from all of the realities of suffering. And then of course he uh, got curious and jumped the wall of the temple and he had three sightings, right? He saw a sick man or a person, a sick person, an old person, and a dead body. And it was seeing those three things that, that really shocked him, right? He saw this suffering and he was just like, wow, you people live like this? <laughs> this is a reality? And I know I've said this in, in Dharma talks before, but it's just so the crux of it all to me and, and the koan, one of the koans of my life is that in response to these sightings, in response to this confronting sickness, old age, and death, his response wasn't to build a bunch of clinics and fund a bunch of uh, medicine healers and create hospice care, right? Like he didn't, he didn't, his, his instinct wasn't to use his money and his power as a chieftain's son or a prince or whatever to make societal change, right? His reaction was to take a spiritual path, to be still, to investigate the nature of this suffering, to really find out for himself, what is this? Who am I? What is this existence? Why are we here? All of these existential questions. That's how he decided to respond to this suffering. And so I kind of see a parallel here um, when last Saturday happened in Buffalo and all the other tragic um, events of similar nature. And I'll explain what I mean. So, I guess I can't speak for everybody, but I, I assume I kind of can speak for everybody here that most of us live um, with the privilege, just like the Buddha was privileged in his upbringing. Most of us live with the privilege of um, living in a pretty diverse, inclusive, open-minded situation. Um, I can speak for myself. I have uh, all kinds of people around me. The intersectionality chart is well represented in my reality, my day-to-day -day life. I was raised in a household that promoted uh, inclusion, open-mindedness, acceptance, um, love for all people. Um, and that is kind of a privilege. I've never really thought about it so clearly until really reflecting on this. Um, but man, like when I think about 
places I've been, like not only in America, but around the world where they don't necessarily have access to such diversity. Everyone around them kind of looks the same, kind of had the same upbringing, same religion, same, you know, kind of conditioning. Um, there's just something missing there, right? The fact that we get to live where we live and have the, the open-mindedness that, that we have and the people around us, it just makes for such a colorful, uh, rich, um, exciting, uh, diverse, um, just rich, just rich life. And I see that as a privilege uh, to be able to live, you know, with those kinds of people, open-minded and diverse, you know, people around me. And then, so then the Buddha hops the wall and has these sightings of suffering. Uh, we didn't necessarily hop a wall, but maybe we turned on our TV and watched the news or opened up the newspaper and read the news. And that's our kind of wall hopping. And then we have this shocking sight, this shocking confrontation with the fact that there's people out there who want to kill people that don't look like them. And at least for me, I kind of had that feeling that I think the Buddha had of like, holy shit, like you people live like this. This is a reality. People actually want to murder, like what an awful, awful existence that must be. What a terrible thing that is that I'm kind of shielded from living in San Diego, working at a Buddhist temple, associating with spiritual, creative, artistic people. I've just been, you know, even though it, it keeps happening, I'm still able to kind of crawl back into my bubble of, of diversity, inclusion, um, you know, passion for social justice. And so seeing that this happens is kind of like that wake up call, like, oh my God. So I'm sure a lot of us are, are very familiar with the instinct to make societal change, right? To make policy change, to make legislative change, do something about guns, do something about racism on TV do something about uh, mental health, right? All these kind of societal uh, social action that we can take. There's, there's definitely that instinct. Um, and our particular lineage of Buddhism is steeped in that, right? Like Bernie Glassman, who is our Dharma grandfather, his whole deal as he matured in his practice was incorporating social action within our practice. But by looking at this story of the Buddha, like I said, his reaction was not to make societal change. His reaction was to be still and to investigate his relationship with suffering. What is this suffering? And so insofar as we are a Zen center and our mission is to carry forward uh, Zen practice, to carry forward what the Buddha taught, um, I feel this kind of, uh, in addition to that instinct to wanting to make societal change, I feel equally strong about um, what the spiritual path has to say about how to deal with this. How does being still, how does, you know, turning the light inward, as we say, um, kind of a famous Zen quote. What role does that play in, in living with this reality of hatred? And um, that kind of instinct, that, that spiritual instinct that I was feeling was kind of reinforced, affirmed, and um, encouraged when I was talking to um, a Dharma friend of mine, a Dharma cousin, and this happens to be an African-American Dharma cousin. And we were talking about the shooting. 
And uh, basically the first thing they said, you know, we said how awful it is and how terrible, but the first thing they said was, gosh, how much suffering that guy must have been going through. That guy being Peyton Gendron, who committed the crime. And I mean, that was just like, for me, you know, here is an African American male who is well acquainted with the fight for equality and equity. Um, and his first response or one of the first responses was, gosh, that guy must have been suffering so much. And it was just, it was so much deeper than empathy at that moment for me. It's not just empathy. It's not just, there was something very viscerally one about him saying that. And it just really kind of illuminated the role of our spiritual path. Um, not fighting hate with hate, not fighting hate with um, campaigns, petitions, um, canceling Tucker Carlson. <laughs> um, and, you know, all those things are important. Um, and taking action in the world is, um, you know, we talk about it all the time. And, and I don't feel the need to talk about it because that's our instinct. I feel like we're all kind of good there. We all want to do that. But to really shine light on this spiritual aspect, the, the benefit of this oneness, right? The oneness of that being Peyton Gendron. Um, you know, not just, not just intellectually understanding, oh, well, he was mentally ill, and so we have to do something about mental health, but really embodying what is from innumerable perspectives. Um, I just believe that that is, will, will play a very important role um, in, in abolishing hate and abolishing violence as we move forward as, um, as a species. And so I'm reflecting on this kind of genuine oneness and the role that it plays. And it reminded me of a really cool koan from the Book of Equanimity, also known as the Book of Serenity, also known as the Shoyoroku in Japanese. Um, so I'll just kind of quickly go through it and maybe it'll inspire something. So the main case, attention, Sozan asked Toku Joza, Buddha's true Dharmakaya is like the vast sky. It's conforming to things and manifesting shapes is like the moon in the water. How can this principle of conforming be expressed? And then Toku, the student in this situation, says, it's like the donkey seeing the well. Sozan remarked, well said, but that's only 80% of it. And then Toku responded, okay, well then how about you, master? Sozan replied, the well sees the donkey. So if we go line by line, Sozan, uh, who, um, you know, are officially Sweetwater Zen Center is in the Soto lineage, right? Soto Zen. And Soto actually comes from the two founding Chinese teachers of this lineage, Sozan and Tozan. So, To. Little bit of history for you. Um, so Sozan asked his student, Buddha's true Dharmakaya is like the vast sky. So Kaya is a uh, body, I believe in Sanskrit, I think. So Dharmakaya, the body of the Dharma, the body of reality, right? So basically true reality 
ultimate truth of everything, universal absoluteness, is like the vast sky. And if you think about the sky, it's really interesting. Like the sky is not a thing, right? Like Kim's here, she's a science teacher, she knows. The sky is not a thing. It's like always blows my mind because you look up and it looks like a flat piece of blue, right? It looks like a thing that's up there. But the sky is actually not a thing. It's completely vast and empty. And when it's sunny, uh, the Shaley effect, is that what it's called? The, ra the rally, the rally effect is what makes it look blue, right? It's about light particles refracting and waveforms, or that's why it looks blue. So it just looks like a flat piece of blue, but then when it's cloudy, it looks like a textured gray thing. When it's nighttime, it looks like a black thing with white dots on it. When it's sunset, it looks like an orange and red thing, right? So the sky is actually not a thing. It is this vast, empty spaciousness that simply allows for things to happen. So that's why we often use it as a metaphor for what our true nature is, what we really are. All of us, not just us humans, every last little thing is a vast emptiness, oneness, one entity that just allows, whether we know it or not, that just allows for various conditions and causes and effects to manifest. Even Peyton fucking Gendron, an absolute Buddha, completely empty, completely one with everything. So Buddha's true Dharmakaya, the absolute reality of this universe is just a vast sky. It's conforming to things and manifesting shapes is like the moon in the water, right? So that's kind of just expanding on that first part, right? All of us, myself, Peyton Gendron, the bird in the trees, um, Ruth Whitfield, who was one of the victims last Saturday, all of us just simply products of karma, right? Karma we talk about as the law of cause and effect, conditioning. Innately, we are all vast sky Buddhas. And we just simply fall into samsara, which is cause and effect, the law of karma. And so we manifest shapes, we manifest personalities, we buy clothes, we do our hair, we have relationships. Trees grow and bear fruit, all according to just this empty functioning of karma, cause and effect. And it's like the moon reflecting on the water, right? That's kind of another way of saying that we are all, you know, the moon is often used as a metaphor for enlightenment. In Zen, Dogen talks about the moon all the time. And so, however, we are reflecting our conditions and our karma it's all just a reflection of perfect enlightenment. There's nothing separate. The sky is not separate from the clouds, right? If you look at a totally cloudy sky, we don't say necessarily, look at those clouds in the sky. We say, look, there's the sky. They're not separate. They manifest each other. So everything we do, every shape we take, every form we take, every emotion we feel, every meal we eat is simply a reflection of the constant enlightenment that is this moment. And hearing it coming out of my mouth, it just sounds ridiculous and doesn't make any sense. And that's why we sit for hours and hours and years and years to really embody that, to really fully in our gut um, manifest that full moon 
reflect that full moon in every moment and see that every moment and everyone and everything is the reflection of that full moon. Even Peyton fucking Gendron. So he's just kind of like expounding that. And uh, so now he's testing his student and he says, how can this principle of conforming, this principle of every moment being enlightenment, how can you express that, right? Show me that. So any one of us can read Thich Nhat Hanh, read a Buddha book, go to a Dharma talk, hear these things and just kind of like say them, ah, yes, we're all one, everything is enlightenment. But how do you express it right now? That's the point. That's the point of us doing this. That's the point of us coming together. That's the point of us sewing bibs. That's the point of us sitting on the ground. That's the point of us taking time out of our life for doing retreat so that we for ourselves can express authentically this true Buddha Dharmakaya. And it's impossible, but we have to do it. So he asks his student, express it, show it to me. How do you express this reality? And uh, the, the student says, the donkey sees the well. And uh, I'm not exactly sure what he's referencing. I tried to do some research. The best I found was a fable about a, well, a, a donkey falling into a well and he's like suffering, you know, he's like screaming. And then the farmer uh, who owns the land and the well says, oh, well, that donkey's old anyway. I'm just going to put it out of its misery and I'm going to fill up the well with dirt and bury the donkey. So the farmer starts uh, filling up the well with dirt. And he notices that the donkey just keeps like shaking off the dirt and stepping on top of the pile. And then shaking off the dirt and stepping on top of the pile until eventually he gets to the top and is able to leave. Um, and so we, that's kind of a whole other story, but the basic gist of it, um, being open to possibility, right? The farmer starts with the intention of like, I'm going to bury this donkey and put it out of its misery. And then as soon as he starts shoveling, he sees, oh, wait a minute, this is actually helping him. I'm going to keep shoveling. And so being kind of uh, flexible and uh, seeing that all of our intentions, um, all of our plans and expectations, uh, if we let them go, uh, we can, our, our, our action and our compassion can change form. Anyway, I don't know if that's what this student is referencing. I just thought that was an interesting um, explanation for where this donkey comes from. But I think more importantly, it's like the donkey seeing the well uh, is his expression of, you know, seeing your reflection, seeing everything in the universe as you, right? That's his expression of oneness, um, losing the self, dissolving the self, letting go of separation, truly having that experience of seeing myself in everything. And in fact, uh, Shishin Roshi, who's the guy who uh, compiled this book, Shishin Wick, there he is. Um, he says here, um, oh man. I lost it. Well, somewhere in here in his commentary, he says that the donkey seeing the well, as the student says here, is the expression of the complete loss of self and a manifestation of the one body. Sounds pretty nice, right? That's kind of what we're all here for. That's what everybody's talking about in all these books. But then the teacher comes back and says, that's pretty good, but you've only said 80%. So 
So you're saying, I manifest <laughs> this oneness that everybody's talking about, fully, completely dissolving the self, becoming the wisdom and compassion of the Tathagata, and that's only 80%? <laughs> what else do you want from me? And the teacher responds, the well sees the donkey. And what that means ultimately is up for each one of us to see for ourselves what that extra 20% is. Because just mere talking about it, putting it into words and concepts already misses that 20%. Because I think what he's pointing at is like, yes, you can say the donkey sees the well. You can have that experience, that satori or kensho or enlightenment experience of oneness. But that's just that. Now, can you drop off that? Can you drop off dropping off? Can you let go of letting go? And that is not a concept that is not something you can express that is a constant aliveness that is a constant harmony with what is it's a constant practice it's a constant intimacy with impermanence not getting stuck anywhere not even in oneness and that is ultimate oneness that's why i was inspired about this koan when my dharma friend really just had that expression of like man poor peyton as his response to the shooting on saturday so you know i think that this spiritual path um, really does play a role in our fight against hatred, bigotry, and violence. And I think that Tozan's not getting stuck. The well sees the donkey totally getting rid of me. You know, I have the experience of oneness already is missing the other 20% because there's an eye there. And so this process, this practice of constantly letting go, not only applies to our zazen, not only applies to expressing yourself in doksan, not only applies to speaking and writing about the dharma, I think it applies to how we respond to these tragedies. Always fresh, always spontaneous, always coming from not knowing, right? We talk about not knowing a lot. That's what I think this well sees the donkey is getting at. This constant cultivation of not knowing, right? Maybe today we're saying poor Peyton Gendron. Maybe tomorrow we're saying kill them all. Kill all the bigots. We don't know. We don't know what is appropriate. Every moment manifests new appropriateness. And uh, that was really alive when I heard my friend say that the other day. And so um, I hope this, you know, inspires us in some kind of way to, in our, in our move forward, to keep our practice and our action fresh. And... Um, to really honor this practice of stillness, this practice of cultivating oneness, um, at least as a supplement, uh, complementary to our action in the world. I think it will play an essential role in cultivating wisdom and compassion for all beings. <laughs>